All right. You hear me okay? It's good? Yes. I feel like there should be a seatbelt here. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just tall enough to ride this ride, right? Uh, all right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, for you know, We might have some folks that probably don't know who, who we are, so quick intros. I'm Colonel Scott Heathman, the commander of 375. And uh, you know, today we're we're standing out to stand together as we talk about extremism. And we saw some videos this morning in here with the leadership, and we talked a little bit of the environment. And Chief Rizal and I have been kind of walking around uh, this morning, diving into a few sessions, and and there's been some great discussions. And and I think that's probably the highlight of our day is just to be able to see just interaction, real hardcore interaction. And and it doesn't always have to be everybody just. Agree. That's been the beautiful thing about it. But I have an extremely special guest, uh, a mentor of mine, a friend of mine. Uh, we've known each other, we said, about 14 years. Yep. So uh, this is General Retired John Michelle. And uh, I, I'm not going to do one of these 18 minute long intros oh, because it would take 18 minutes, well, I think. So it's about this conversation. Yeah. yeah. So I'll just start off with who, who is John Michelle, the kid? John Michelle, the the airman and John Michelle now the, the businessman. So, okay. well, thank you. First, I want to say thanks, brother. For, uh, I, I was privileged to connect with Scott and we talked with him 14 years ago. Who's the exact one? Nice in Charleston. Literally about day two, you walk in. And, um, I was new to the C-17 community. And, um, we immediately jumped into a project which ultimately had a command-wide impact. And from that time frame, we realized that we share a genuine love for other human beings, to drive for positive progress, uh, and as well as a lifelong affinity for the Air Force. So um, in a nutshell, I'm, uh, my parents immigrated to the United States. The American dream captivated my dad. Um, he uh, were, lived outside a military base in France. I've seen airplanes, U.S. airplanes land. So the story of, you know, 17 years old, one-way ticket, becomes a, come, uh, enlists in the Air Force, and uh, 30 years later retires as command chief. And then served 25 years building ACCs in the Air Force's people programs that you would now call resilience. All those things called Tom P was the architect of that. Things like Heartlink. Um, and the reason I share that as my background is I have been extraordinarily blessed to be uh, surrounded by mentors and people who love this nation, who uh, understand the value and the power of service, and who are selfless and always do it through what matters most. And that's uh, loving and caring for the people. So I grew up in a, a space like that, spent a lot of time in Europe around the power of a table, around food, which we may talk about more because I'm involved in that again. And so as a young person, so I was kind of small and I'd like to say scrappy, and it taught me to uh, have to dig hard and work hard. <laughs> and then uh, beyond that, I joined the Air Force by accident. I kind of like the accident in general. I uh, thought I was gonna be a lawyer. I ended up going ROTC camp uh, because I needed a couple hundred extra bucks for some social ventures. So I joined ROTC and I'm just being honest, it worked out, so I didn't realize I had this big affinity for leadership. And then, uh, the, the, so they gave me a scholarship to fly airplanes, and after that, it was 26 and a half years later before I realized I'm going to have to jump off and do some other things that I'm kind of interested in because I was just turning 50 uh, after Afghanistan. So um, Air Force was an amazingly blessed time. I still love it. I will always love it. It's been in my, our family goes back four generations between the French military and between. And then uh, I went to the big business world, and uh, did a big corporate uh, C-suite job and hated it. So um, I, it's just, I didn't feel we could connect people in a way that I was always passionate about as a squadron commander, as a wing commander and all that stuff. And so then I uh, moved into the world of entrepreneur. I love entrepreneurialism. Um, it's risky. You have to motivate people. You have to use all your skill. I was talking to the chief about this beforehand because if you can't pay, pay people what they're worth, you better inspire them a lot. You better motivate them a lot. And then you better build it together. And now I would consider myself a social entrepreneur. I've been fortunate in business to be able to spend more time in giving back. And uh, we're doing some things here in the community and across the country to uh, be able to get more veterans to be business owners, because I believe we need that leadership, uh, not just behind the wheel, but driving the business like we did after World War II. And, uh, and we believe that there's now more than ever, we need to show the power of people coming together um, to be able to do cool, exciting things. So there's a bar brush. So, as a kid from French family, born in France? I was uh, born in Germany. In Germany, okay. Immigrated over, is there differences in your DNA as a child 
versus your DNA as an airman and the analysis of business. How, how is that going to come to play as far as your leadership? What would you say your style is? I, I mean, it's a great, I, I'd say it's uh, uh, participative. So I, I use the term, the power of the table. Uh, my grandparents owned a restaurant out of Paris and then they migrated a little further from Paris. And my summer job when I was in high school was to go work in their restaurant. So yes, it's cool working in France and all that, but the reality is I saw all the power of relationship over simple things, the power of a table. I mean, I grew up in, and I would say one thing, we like to eat lots in Europe, um, which is, we have good cuisine, I think, but the bigger thing is it's social. We don't stress about a 35 minute lunch. We use that time because we want to honor the other person, we want to enjoy that. And then when it's time to work, we work. So in my DNA is from day one, I saw it modeled uh, and consistently it's always been around how do we find ways to create human connection that's mutually beneficial, that is enjoyable, and that can actually then lead to some pretty extraordinary things. As a wing commander, I'll give you an example. I was up at, I was asked to go to Grand Forks. It was undergoing a few challenges. Uh, the base had been bracked. And uh, at the time that I was, uh, brought up there, it had experienced the, in five categories, led the Air Force. Domestic abuse, I can keep going. None of the ones that you want to be able to. And uh, I got the shortest speech in history from the four star. So, you know, you're a wing commander, you got to go up there and now you're finding out. I, had, I was at Charleston, so I go up there, meet with General Light. I wait, I go in his office, I'm thinking I'm getting this motivational speech about my next gig, right? So I'm like, I just sat me down and says, hi, John, um, I need you to go fix it fixed grant forks. And so then I waited for the wisdom. And then that was it. That was the end of the meeting. I was like, wow, that was so uh, I got back. And, and in getting up there, it was an amazing, all places, uh, it, it's just, it lost its way from the standpoint that BRAC had taken its identity, not much different than humans. And a number of things that transpired. One of the things that I was drawn to do in our, in our and there were a lot of them, we'll get involved with one that relates to this, is I looked, you know, from a having eyes to see from having done some doctoral work and how we drive change, and this power of appreciative inquiries, always look for the assets you have lying right before your eyes and you have eyes to see. And I noticed the chapel basement was wonderful, but it was being used for storage and we could use it for so much more. So we set out to create Sven's Kitchen, which was the first, and this is before 50 food channels and all the other kind of, now we're a foodie culture. This is in 2008. And so the idea was, how do we use the power of food and a space to connect. So we created a Mediterranean style, beautiful uh, cooking area, commercial cooking area in the basement of that chapel. And it was designed for airmen and others. And we gave cooking class, it was designed for them to come together. And it really set the whole wing on a direction that, wow, we actually do have an amazing future. We have a lot of assets. We just need a different way to think about it, to see things. And that's not much different than what we're perhaps gonna talk about some of these things today. What leads people? to the extremes or the edges or feel isolated. It's they become unmoored from that. And so I would say I define, we did other things in the military, but going back to the power of something simple as creating a space to connect over food. And it doesn't have to be food, but consistently throughout my career, I said, when we focus on that, really good things can happen. Yeah. You know, I was gonna ask you, what, what are those moments in the Air Force you missed? I've seen some of them firsthand. It is when you connect. It's, it's, I will never forget, we, you know, the wing commander had gone at Charleston and you got a few of us together at the club and said, the boss is leaving next week. What are we doing this week for fun? <laughs> and, I, and it's great to be the vice. I still, yeah, I still <laughs> laugh at it to, to this day. And I just jokingly said, dodgeball, got to have a dodgeball tournament. It's got to be wing wide. We, yep. And we pulled this off in four days. So we have 500 people here. Oh, uh, at least 500 amazing. people. Um, this is before the movie. Was the movie already out? Maybe we were Maybe inspired just, by the movie. Yeah, I don't just know. come out. Okay. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, I even wrote my sister in this, uh, who was living with us at the time. And, and everybody was dressed. Every unit had their own theme. Yep. And and so they, and we literally just had the bracket. It was still on butcher paper, and we just went. And um, everybody will remember that, you know. Yep. And and I think what that taught me. As a, as a major in Air Force that our senior leaders are willing to find a way to get us together. We're not goofing off. We're, we were damn good at our mission. Um, Charleston was leading the pack at that time and, and doing some great things, but here's an opportunity for us to have permission to 
to go have fun and get together to enjoy that. It didn't take all day, exactly, you know, but it was cheap. It was cheap. Yeah, it was cheap. We got to wear helmets, smash each other with a ball. It was fabulous. <laughs> but you're right. It was lead by example, right? How do you create space? Which is one of the primary roles of a leader is can we hold ourselves accountable to that? I'm doing everything in my sphere. It could be one person or it could be 100,000. Am I doing everything I can to create the conditions for other people to be and do their best? So that's, that's it. Yeah. That's what it boils down to. But I think a lot of times folks are in, in today, let's just even with COVID, I'll take that as an example. We're all looking up as if some leader up there is going to have the answer. If there's not a leader alive in our military right now that is here during the last month. Exactly. And so we're all left with, what do I do? The next one looks up, well, what do I do? There's a lot of talent at a mid level that are willing to just fight through this and take on opportunities. And so what are some ways that have been effective to you and your leadership in the military that you've enabled a young NCO, a young officer to, to get out and, and just lead and conquer? And I think it's a great question. We've all heard by now about this kind of, this concept called psychological safety, which became quite popular after Google did a great leadership. They had this really interesting notion that we don't really need leaders. We just need really smart people to do cool things. They were wrong. And, uh, and they decided no leaders matter for this reason. And what they realize is because leaders set the conditions. And when they look at the conditions that leaders set when they succeed, for then it's this thing that's really around they've succeeded creating psychological safety. So to answer your question, you know, when we look at the ways that uh, that we can do that, how do we get people to uh, uh, it again, it's not hard. I'll give you an example because and it relates to our time in the military together of exactly how you can do it. Because I'll call it the power of invitation. When I was asked, so after I made GEO, I was asked to go to now take on another, I'll just say, fix the project. And this one was the Afghan Air Force. Um, you know, so I went over to be NATO, the commanding general for NATO on that, about a $7 billion project. It was really complex and challenging. Um, but um, shortly after landing, we do what we normally do. We get the team together. And it was interesting. We have a propensity that we had a finite amount of time, had a pretty big mandate reporting directly to the chief and up from that. And so there was a lot of pressure, but we took the time to actually really assess what was going on. And I remember the senior leaders, as we were thinking through, I had my, uh, our team had thought through all the colonels and the chiefs. And we said, okay, we got this figured out. We're going to do these X amount of things to get this back on track. But we did something wise, I think, and it answered your question. We paused and I said, okay, now push back from the table. And then uh, we walked the hallway and did what I call random sample club. And we found some, our staff sergeants and we found our, our guys from uh, Canada, whoever was just sitting at their desk or doing their job that day didn't have any idea. We brought them into the room and sat them at the table. And then we, the senior leaders, pitched what we thought was a perfect plan to them about what we're going to do to turn around the struggling air force. This wasn't a little project, right? I could tell you that. 100% of our ideas did not survive contact with their own people. They had, you know why? Because they had different perspective. They were going to be the wrench turners. They were going to be the ones that were going to do their training programs. And so oftentimes, in the great intentions of trying to do the right thing, we overlook the fact that the single biggest thing we do is create opportunities for inclusion through conversation. I call it, if you do one thing, become a beautiful question asker. And in this case, the beautiful questions we're asking our own people who normally would not be sitting at the big table was, here's what we think. You think it'll work. Why not? And it sounds so simple, but I wonder in the haste and the pace of our days, do we walk by opportunities to take a pause and invite people not like us in rank in how their background is? So it relates to a lot of the frustration that we're seeing. You know, we want to use this term extremism but for isolation. It's because people want to belong and people want to believe their voice matters. And so it's a simple but very powerful example because those folks equally. So one year later, this organization that I just happened to be, get to be the, the face of and voice of was selected as the DOD, the number one innovative nation building project. And it wasn't because I was having everything figured out. It was the power of participative leadership. As you asked me in the beginning, uh, so how would I describe leadership style? I love humans, but I have to prove it to you, which means I have to invite you. I have to include you. And I think that simple formula, and I trust me, I have a PhD in this, so I could give you a bunch of theory stuff, which I'm not going to do because that doesn't matter. These are things that everybody, regardless of where they fit in that, like you're saying, that, that totem pole or hierarchy or rank structure, 
We can do that with one airman. You can do that with five. You do it, I know, because you know we've known each other for a long time and your heart is to serve, which means it's not about that. So I would tell you, that's what we can all do. Yeah. And book plug, I didn't write this one. Uh, if you haven't read A More Beautiful Question, it is such a fabulous book. It really changes. I mean, I always studied these things and understood these things. I thought I'm an org development guy and a performance guy. But this book gave me a framework to think about it and reinforced. And here's why I think it's really important. I don't know if we have any people who are, who are teachers in the background, right? but we are at our best when we're five years old. Here's why I say that. We don't judge. We're open-minded. We're curious. And you know what else we do? We ask about 400 to 500 questions a day. Now, all you parents are like, yes, I know. Please don't remind me. I have a therapist because of it. But the reality is we are little joy machines looking for goodness in people and how to do things all around. We're a discovery, right? Well, as for on us, that kind of gets squeezed out of us over time. And there's just the structures of how we do schooling and stuff. Question asking is beaten out of us. Fact. By the time you're 16 years old, we see the question asking diminishes by over 80% of schools. You, you do realize that that doesn't come back naturally because now we go to organizations and question asking can be perceived as like, uh, perhaps, you know, uh, don't really believe what leadership's saying. So think about it. We don't stop to go, wow, we actually are. I'm fine. I was cool with it. <laughs> now at 15, I'm like, uh-oh, now if I ask questions in class, the teacher's going to get, you know, I just have to, I have to learn this test. And it gets worse as we get into bureaucracies or function. So, you know, I kind of take away point one, a more beautiful question really, and a couple of other books, but really opened me up to, dang, if I just can be more intentional about asking good questions. And good questions is just, you listen, you're listening. Not something as my wife would tell you, I'm usually good at naturally, but you listen and then you look for a way to perhaps ask another question. Unbelievable. I believe we could transform every institution through simply learning to become better. There's been a lot of studies with five-year-olds and engineers, which ones of marshmallow power. Yep. And it's always the five-year-olds that build all the structure because they dive in. They're not worried about organization. They're taking risks. Yep. Just getting after it. Unbounded or thinking. Absolutely. That's what it is. And we found ourselves, I mean, here, you don't want to be the last to ask a question, right? Because you delay everybody from going home. Yep, exactly. Or so hard to go first and hard to go last. Because you're like, well, what if it's perceived as a dumb question? But my boss thinks we don't want to ask questions in front of our bosses because we're like, well, is he going to think I don't know? Uh, and we got this internal narrative. Though. That's why you go back to leaders. The role of the leader is to say, okay, ask some questions, even if it's a dumb question. I mean, to get that kind of to, to to demonstrate that behavior. So as you can see, I'm a fan of beautiful question asking. If you get bored and you want to do a lot of uh, book plug one, uh, a more we beautiful question. Books. Yeah, I have a feeling by the time we're done, if nothing else, it's going to feel like we hang out in the library. library door. That's okay. So let's just jump into the topic yeah. of the day. We, you know, so this was uh, a Secretary of Defense directed in order to uh, unit commanders to stand uh, January 6th. So I remember what I was doing on January 6th. I was in an MRI machine, you know, having, yeah. my, having uh, my brain looked at and uh, it took a couple hours to get through, meet the docs, and it came out about midday. And, you know, all the news apps, I had my phone, every single one of them, notifications about what was going on in the Capitol. What were you, what were you doing? What was going through your mind that day? That's a great question. So I was in... Uh in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, doing a uh, radio show about leadership, performance, employees, because we own a restaurant chain. Um, and I would tell you the emotion that, uh, and I, first, you're bewildered. You're like, is this America? There's just, I mean, so I think we had this cognitive dissonance. When, uh, but the thing is, then there was, you know, a sadness that I hadn't felt in a long time, because it was a profound sadness, like here kind of sadness, because we had been watching a number of things and I'm kind of like a little bit of a closet social psychologist and neuroscientist. And we've been watching a number of things and watching a series of statistics and been showing this kind of erosion of democracy before our eyes. Maybe we'll talk about that this interesting people later, but it was a profound sadness to see how did we allow ourselves to get to this place? Um, you know, before we recognize that there might be military involved, we can talk about that. It's to realize that we didn't get here overnight 
And the fact that we in this country, who are the most blessed place on earth, and at least historically have set a pretty decent example for others, could allow ourselves to descend to a place, even if it was momentary, that doesn't matter. It's now on the tapes forever. We have our kids watching this. We have the world watching this. So yeah, I would say profound sadness, sadness, that because it's all unnecessary. Yeah, I, I remember a few days later, uh, an officer, a Navy captain in the Dominican Republic, and we went to the Navy Board House. It's kind of hit me on WhatsApp. And like, we wanted to check out the person. We ended up in this discussion, and he said, Scott, I got to be honest. This is not what I expected in the United States. Uh, this, you know, this is what I expected in my country. Exactly. You know? and, and we're, we're doing a, a, like a FaceTime call, so I can see everything. And she's just like, I feel a little bit lost because we are all looking at you. Exactly. And, and we showed some polls this morning, the Gallup polls that show, you know, the U.S. military is one of the most trusted institutions. And you got small businesses and you've got teachers and stuff there at the top. All of that's under attack. You know, to to a degree from a foreign perspective, mm -hmm. there are those going. Yes, this is exactly what we want to have happen. Exactly, uh, a few of those out there, and our allies are, yeah, they're left a little bit confused. And so, when you see the headlines then that pop up within the next few days of one in five of the participants is potentially military. Now, we got to be careful about those headlines, right? Indeed. Um, but when you see those headlines, what's is that changing your perspective on the day? Well, I would tell you, uh, you know, this is something I just learned, learned over time. I take all those things with some perspective because here's what we've learned. I, I can think of a several instances we've had a shooter incident in America. And I'm, I'm gonna try to be careful how I say this about the media. Um, the media has become a catalyst in many regards for sensationalism and about other things. So when I saw that headline, one, I wasn't surprised. And you know why? Because there's a reason to do that. We are at the top of the stack in terms of legitimized organizations that people fear and trust. The challenge with that is when things go bad, that works against you. So there's a, there's a desire and an intentionality in trying to paint this horribleness that occurred. And by pinning it on people who we're supposed to trust, it leads to greater fragmentation greater division, greater sensations. And so in seeing that, I wasn't surprised because here's the context we're missing unless we're going to be good question askers and good critical thinkers. Um, yeah, there probably are, but I mean, were they associated with 20 years ago? Were they dishonorably discharged? Were they, I mean, there's a whole bunch of other things that get lost in that. And if you take it at face value, not just for that incident, but for a lot of stuff that we're you know, in, infusing in our bodies via our cell phones and other things. This is how we can, we live in a world where it's never been easier to divide and conquer. What we saw on that day was some intentionality to do those kind of things and an erosion of the fundamental elements of an effective democracy. And when those converge, you kind of, you have a moment like that, but that, that you're right. Great example of your friend. We didn't just let ourselves down. We literally, you know, slipped in the world, in the, in the eyes of a world that regardless of how much they may say, you know, America, this, you know, um, you know, capitalism bad. The reality is a lot of people, we're the beacon on the hill. We have. And so I took it at face value, understanding. There, and now, is there some folks in that, which is what led to this? I read your, your package, that the, and there's some interesting good stuff in there. Um, even the individuals who were did not get there overnight. Now, there's some. Um, that we can talk about that may have propensities and stuff, but those are such tiny numbers. The reality is they represent what you can allow a little bit for an institution like ours to have somehow slip into that. Even any of them um, bode, doesn't bode well in terms of, it's a reminder of why it's so important to do stuff like we're doing today, and why it was smart for the sector to say, this is, we have to talk about it. Yeah, because your so, association is for life. It's for like, like, you know, John, I mean, I may be a, what I call social entrepreneur now and I get to do a bunch of things all the lot of, you never, I take the uniform off, uh, like, I don't even know what years, like six or seven years ago or something, right? But every single one of us is associated for life. And most of the time it's a source of joy. It's a source of joy and gratitude because we're like, yes, we proudly go, I'm a veteran from the military, the Air Force. 
The challenge is when something like that happens, it taints the entire institution, right? Yeah. And so we don't ever walk away from the uniform. We know that we say that, but we just don't. Now we got a manif- an example of the sting that it leaves our association for life with a wonderful organization like this when it's not used within the context of what it was designed to do. And dividing and using inappropriate means to speak out against people's frustration with the government, I think we saw, not an appropriate use of our influence. Yeah, I, I wanna to say too, uh, we are totally open for questions, all right? So anybody in the room, anybody online, and we'll repeat, you know, if you wanna give us the question, we'll repeat, do you have one? Okay, uh, absolutely okay. So we want this to be a good free flowing idea and in exchange with you all too. So if something piques your interest, you're like, let us know. And I think if I could, I just add, um, it's pretty rare. We just have a conversation kind of just amongst people. And the background is this con- this notion of extremism dealing with it. And really at the end of the day, this is about individual and collective leadership and about things we can relate to. So I, I would think is it fair to say, let's not be bound by anything related to extremism or just what the label is on this day. This is, I think, and what Scott and I had talked about beforehand is they've given us good guidance. We understand it. I could, I could even give you some of this, but then we may talk about some of the factors that leave there from a poll push. And, um, but this is about how can we be more, more effective and maybe helping people not go there that may be on a trajectory. How do we lead more effectively as people and as an organization? How can we pay attention more and just walk away with something tangible that we now are a better organization because the secretary and the chief gave you this day to go, let's take a breath. Let's have some, let's have some conversation. Let's do some team building this morning. Let's maybe spend some time in an auditorium. And so if there's things that are near and dear to you that relate to leadership or anything that you think can make it more effective, I think that's a fair main question. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it doesn't have to be about extremism or about the, just the dynamic. We, we don't know how this play is going to go. We were rehearsed like a half dozen times in the last month. Right? Yeah, which is really just excuses to drink coffee. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, so let's go down that road a little bit of division versus isolation. You know, you, you said, yeah, the match group. This didn't happen. Before that. Nope. This didn't brew a month prior to this. This didn't brew from any one person. This has been brewing for a while. It yeah, absolutely uh, for a lot yep. of people. And it's a slow burn for a lot of people to get to whatever extreme that they can potentially find themselves on. Exactly. I, I think the challenge for us. Um, is to try to understand when and how to intervene. What are you looking for? And so that's a really, I'm going to be honest. I, I, it's one of the joys, and there are many, of being, if you want to call it retired, at least from the military, is you have the opportunity to share your pictures of my opinion in, in a question like that. So, um, and when I read the guide, 50 pages or 2,000, or whatever it was, and you guys got it in advance of this day, there was some good stuff in there. But I told Scott in the antechamber green room, I go, one of my concerns here before we walked into the session is because this is a very challenging topic and because there's so many, I don't even know if there's another color other than, I mean, gray is the only thing I can relate it to because there is no black and white here. I mean, how you make this determination for intervention. I mean, if, if you walk in on someone putting together wires and big batteries or things with fertilizer, uh, that's obvious and that's not going to happen. But the vast majority of them are subtle. And so we want to make sure, and I know it's the secretary and everyone's intent is not to get us to a place where we immediately turn into fear factor society. We got plenty of help from the press with that every single day. If you can't, because that erodes the fabric of trust that actually pulls us into the institution together. We have to be, I think, much more deliberate and intentional, which is why we're kind of wanting to keep the conversation around more of the human dynamic, leadership dynamic. Um, because it is in that subtlety and the willingness to have the confidence to intervene with appropriate skills. And I go back to one of those question asking. So I'm going to back up to ask, you said, how do we get, and maybe a couple of things I can share with you in terms of the work I do with organizations in terms of how to get high performance. Um, because I said, we didn't get here overnight. Some of you may be familiar with Robert Putnam's work, but it was, I mean, earth shaking to me. Um, Back in, when I, was, after, when I was a wing commander, I developed a program to deal with some of the positive behaviors that we were experiencing in our wing. And then I, uh, we were so successful there after about 14 months, I got pulled up to be the exec. Now, I would not necessarily, I mean, I appreciate the opportunity, but anyhow. Uh, and so that wasn't what I expected. I would rather have stayed in command. 
But the blessing that came out of that is this program I developed ended up becoming something called the Positive Principles. And I taught for over four years, every squatter and commander and their spouse. That was good. And then now we got way better programs. But back then in 2009, we didn't really have it to formalize it. And it was based on the work with Gallup. And again, my background and my PhD is in this. So we tried to apply, but in human ways, you know, we talked about the simple gratitude to self. And this was early day, right? But the, the, the study that really kind of rocked my world that showed me like, uh-oh, we better pay attention here, not just America. Robert Putnam did a ground, he's a sociologist out of Harvard, he did a groundbreaking study that looked at democracies only work, only work through participation. Now you notice I asked what kind of style do I have? Participation. Except in a democracy, what happens is this participation can be measured in what we call binding and bonding social capital. I can, I can be in a reciprocal, and like Velcro, it takes two pieces, right? Not enough for me. I mean, it's right. And so participation means I can believe in the institution. I want to be involved in the institution. It's that dynamic. That is actually the fabric of democracy. And he had gone back and looked from 1776 and measured the ebb and flow of our ability to have bonding and binding social capital as a people, our people called citizens of the United States. And it ebbed and flowed until the 1950s when it took a big drop. And then it came back a little bit, then it dropped again. And, you know, when you look at those drops, you know, that first drop, you know what it was, what caused that, which means we weren't creating the bonding and binding social capital. So the fabric started to pull apart for us to have relationships of mutual benefit, mutual interest. And it was the advent of the uh, television set. Because in the old days, I'd huddle in the living room around with my neighbors and listen to the radio. It was only one out of five families could afford it or have one. But now the television now created a place. Now we can start, to, if you will, already. Now I'm not huddled necessarily. I'm watching this particular screen. And then we saw another big drop several decade, a decade later when the advent of the microwave. And that, what that did is displace the most, what was, I think, the most important piece of furniture in a house. And it's called the dining room table. Now I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I can say I grew up every single night at a table. <laughs> you know, it's a European thing. And I think you talk to folks, now they're a little older, they grew up with that dynamic. I think it's fair to say we have a very different dynamic. And I'm not saying technology is all bad. It's, it, technology is wonderful in many regards, but it goes both ways, cuts both ways. So the advent of the television disrupted some of our social mechanisms for connection. The advent, the introduction of the microwave did the same thing. And as you now, and then the biggest disruption that's ever happened is the advent of, and the introduction of the, of the smartphone. So when you put these together, not technology, but again, they enable so many amazing things and throw the internet at them. The problem is the casualty of taking all these rounds has been our ability to form bonding and binding social capital. And I'm not talking about collecting a thousand friends on Facebook. We know that, and that's not what this conversation is about. But what happened on that day is a reflection of, and people were putting out the alarm about, wait a second here, a democracy can't work if people don't participate. So I can now tell you, take a look at voting numbers and look at re-elections at 30 some odd percent. So when you have a society that's based on a certain mindset of participation, and participation means I need connection, and I need to be able to find what I call this third space, this third space, and that's me, and that's you, and this space is a space of intentionality where regardless of our differences in opinion, our background, skin color, whatever, we're always willing to suspend those things for the goal of finding a way for commonality. I was fortunate to be able to be a fellow at Harvard. And one of the things there that you don't have to go, I'm gonna give you the whole like the program of negotiation which is world renowned. <laughs> don't bother. Basically, we all hear win-win negotiation. I would say distill that down to filter in your mind, am I doing everything I can to find a third space? And I would tell you, you don't have to answer the question. If you look at politics today, or if you look at a lot of other things, we have, I would say, repeatedly demonstrated an inability in recent times to move away from our corners. And what happens when a democracy moves this way, if it's working, I'll, I'll let you be the judge of what you're seeing up there. And it works when the arrows are pointed this way, not this way. By the way, the same thing. So you have this breakdown. So now we have a society feeling increasingly disconnected. You add in technology, levels of isolation and, so, and, and loneliness in society are historic levels with young people on this end and old people on that end. Distressing. The real pandemic, wasn't coronavirus. It's the mental health crisis that's emerging from coronavirus. My point is these social cues and these things 
So when I say my heart hurt when I saw them, I can't say I'm surprised <laughs> because I, those trends, we look at, I go back to the positive principles. We're designing what we can learn from the business world because the business world knows there's real value, whether you measure it in the bottom line through retention, satisfaction, engagement, we know all these things. And I have a business motive. So they were on the forefront in the 90s. And this is where the best workplace institute came from, right? And so, and we've gotten better about this. But my point is, you have this wave washing up society. You have technology and you have an increasing sense of disconnection. And then you have our history. So I talked to you about that's what's been happening, measured by social psychologists and said, our binding and bonding social capital isn't working like it has in our history. That's one. Then you look at the factors and then extremism. We have two primary factors we look at and they're called push factors and pull factors, right? It's really simple. Push factor, when you think about structural factors like discrimination, you know, racism, let's be real. The nation has a history that we have to, that we're working through and we have to, so those don't go away overnight. So you have these factors already running in the background, which influence individual ways of thinking, individual experiences. So they come crashing into this world, right? And then you have pull, then you have these, so between the, the push factors, the pull factors, which are more my psychological factor, issues, you put all that together and we increasingly are finding ourselves by now it's easier to be isolated, divided, and find reasons not to be together, not to find commonality, not to see the goodness and diversity. It is the amazing blessing. I go back to random sample club. Us fancy colonels and generals, not one idea survived contact with our staff sergeants, but we celebrated it. We didn't run from it or ignore it. I bring it back to this. What we are facing, I think, is a clarion call to get back to this problem is going to be solved one person at a time, one leader at a time. It isn't going to be, this is great, but it's going to be people being much more intentional about how do I do my part to maximize connection, whether it's through questions, invitation, inviting people that don't look like us, think like us. So I'll leave it at that, if that answers your question, because that's a lot. You got a little bit of sociology credit in there. We got some, um, and there's a formula that we may get to that I teach a lot of companies about because a lot of times I tell folks, look, you know, you got to listen to this. And you're paying me X amount of dollars to do that or whatever. Not here. I'm just talking to I said, if you really should get one thing. And I will, before we leave, if you're interested, I'm going to give you the one thing. Because I've built every organization around this. And it's a five-step formula that anybody can do. Which, by the way, I would tell you, takes care of outside of the folks that have, for whatever reason, due to psychological issues or other issues. There are a group of people in the world. They're tiny, small group that are gonna be bent towards extremism and you're not stopping. That's where it's time to say, call the OSI then. Just don't call the OSI first would be my advice to you <laughs> because the impact to the institution can be not good. We had, we had this discussion earlier today as to how around. We said, you know, you find an airman, let's say in the dorms, you know, your neighbor, and they're sitting there just reading the communist manifesto. Yep. Probably not a good idea to call OSI first because you don't even understand Context. You're exactly right. Right. Back to context. Yeah. And, and I do think the playbook, and we've talked about this more than what I thought we would get. Uh, a lot of airmen are thinking, yeah, hey, we're not professionals. We don't, we don't have to teach this. So there was a lot of folks doing a lot of self study. How would we even approach this? I include myself, in chief, many in the firm. You know, how do we get ourselves smart? So we're all like cramming for a test, right? Watching TED Talks and trying to pull some books off the shelf. And, yep. Get it wherever we can, but but a realistic scenario like this, where you're walking down the hallway and your airman's reading the communist manifesto. So just for fun, you know. Um, so let's role play for a second. So he's reading the communist manifesto. You're in there. I'm walking in the room, right? This is a small example of how this could be good, but potentially very bad. <laughs> so one way to go, communist manifesto. Scotty, let's read that. He's the wing commander. What is going on? I think that's bad. I Google up communist manifesto and realize, like, oh my gosh, this is like. Uh, the democracy and i call the outside that is one outcome i could do that and i no. then there's the other outcome that goes hey scott communist manifesto i think i read that in college what is uh what do you think i mean uh are you finding some interesting ideas or what drew you to? you know chief told me to, to learn my enemy you know we're in a we're in a great state of uh, competition right now 
and the focus is on China and Russia. We've got two communist nations here. Why don't I go to their playbook, understand their psychology, and dive in? What a good so, idea. So when you're done there, I mean, what are you thinking? Maybe you're going to sell out some of the key ideas and maybe share them with other people yeah. so that we can understand the mind of maybe you know, why people are motivated against us. Yeah, I, I think we'll see what comes out of it. Maybe there's something else I want to read to, to dive into this or maybe I go read Miles' playbook, understand what Miles did and um, maybe go talk to Intel and see what, there's, what their analysts are saying. But yeah, I, I think we owe it to ourselves. This is what our leadership said we should be doing. So, so you see, so just in that, we just made that up. We didn't actually point it out, right? But what's interesting about that is it could have been a call to OSI because I was like, mm, I don't understand this. I think that's bad and therefore he must be bad or have bad intent. <laughs> or I asked, I told you a little while ago, a simple question and inquire about it. And then in that engagement, it gives you an opportunity to start. Now, if they get to be, you know, this could go enough. I think it would be very rare to think that in exchange, someone would be like, oh yeah, I hate America. I'm trying to learn what, you know, that's probably not going to happen. But the main thing I want you to take away from that is, the, the, so the courage, if there had to be any kind of demonstration of what we call tangible courage, instead of like this, you know, this no John Chapman movie they're going to make, which you probably heard about that, I can't wait. That's like serious courage, right? This is just the courage to go, you know what, I could either make a judgment, this is all the side voice, about what I'm seeing. And we often do this, not all the malicious, but if we do this, we can make a judgment. And instead of now being able to find a way, whether I can validate that or be curious, try to find a way to make it more of a positive reaction, a third spacing reaction. It was a simple question to engage in what we realized is a very different outcome. And I think that there's a lot of times we can do that because there is a lot of misunderstanding through our own biases, right? You guys, I think, talked about confirmatory bias today. <laughs> that is the confirm. I mean, we're all wired that way. We want things that are going to reinforce our internal narrative, our belief system, our desire, blah, blah, blah. And the world's great. At Confirmatory bias. I'm going to share you another dorky study, so you don't have to read it. it. Came out 25 days ago. Neuroscientist in Serbia released this. Did a study about the impact of social media, right, on, on our brains. And so we already well know that, you know, with these uh, things like like when we're following things like on Facebook or Instagram, we're kind of like those, you know, those rats that learn to hit with their paw, their nose, and that little freaking piece of food comes down and become addicted to like rat crack. Um, well, what happens is that. Our version of that we know is this little dopamine hit. And they, you know, we well, it's well documented. Yep, we get that from these interactions with social media. But the part that was interesting about the study that I found is what we don't necessarily talk about is when something else gets introduced into, so like we see an ad or something that disrupts my dopamine flow on here, we actually have a very negative reaction internally. And we don't necessarily register it unless you're having either really sensitive equipment or your consciousness. So my point is, anytime something disrupts our flow, of what we really want to believe or what I want to focus on or make it feel good, at some subconscious level, it's making me pissed off. It's making me a little frustrated. So imagine how you get to extremism. It isn't like one big hit. It's lots of opportunities for little hits because of my confirmatory bias that I am set in my way of thinking. And the only way to undo that way of thinking is I have to open myself up to go, how's that book? Or what can I learn about my enemy, right? So. My favorite word, I think, is intentionality. Everything we've talked about is intentionality. Leadership is intentional, whether it's as a parent. Every, and I think if we're more, and I think it's what we're after with this, with this day, is how can we be more intentional about being more effective and engaging with another, connecting, paying attention, but before we judge. And by the way, this plays very well, not just judge about him reading the communist manifesto, judge about anything. Because the reality is, you know, we understand fundamentally that we are all really alike. We just have different backgrounds, different experiences, and all this other stuff. So I celebrate the fact we're talking about diversity and inclusion. But the reality is, um, all that stuff should simply be a reminder that we're seeking to find a way. And I think if we learn to just be intentional about maybe teaching our people to be a little better question askers, we will not become a state that the OSI is going to be agents. And again, I can say that, and I don't say it disrespectfully. I'm just thinking, I think we all agree. We should save the right folks to do their job at the right time. The institution depends on us to make sure we've led and we've done all we need. And I would think as a wing commander, that would fall in line with your intention. Absolutely. See how I got that intention word back in? <laughs> Good question. From the question. Field. All right, field. So it's one of our comments first. Uh, oh, okay, I like but it. it. But it's, we can understand it, right? It's at a third grade level that we can understand. So, oh, uh, yes. 
Uh, so why doesn't the DOD just disallow membership in these types of groups? They don't say you're not allowed. They say active participation. Not allowed, right? um, they allow membership, but not active participation advocacy. Do we have a problem with our laws or do we have a problem in the wording of these laws that is this a way to ensure our amendment rights? You know, why are we not saying just right up front, change the law to say you are not allowed in this, you are not allowed to be a member of any of these groups. We say the opposite. You can be a member, you just can't actively participate. Yep. So that, that's, that's a good question. Yeah. It is. So you had this question in your guys. I don't know if everyone got the, the field day guide or whatever. But there were two questions related to this, and it all hinges around the amendment. And I would tell you, so that insightful, but I think the reality of this is uh, because the First Amendment issue, and it lends itself to a broad interpretive by design, right? I don't think until this event. So we, it was sufficient perhaps in time. So organizations and, and even countries evolved. And I think there were for a long time, we were able to, it wasn't a significant of an issue that we had to get to such a granular level of interpretation. Because getting into the First Amendment, I'm going to tell you, is going to invite a whole bunch, even for the Air Force and the DOD, invite a whole bunch of other lawyers and other people who their responsibility is to make sure that that is interpreted within the intent of them. Um, so I think what we're going to find with this is this created a crystallized. Say, hold on a second. We initially didn't feel the need to necessarily be as brand or perhaps as descriptive. We, I think, I, I, I believe, in my opinion, is we're going to find ourselves an institution act to be much more prescriptive. And now, and it's not going to happen overnight because you're dealing with a fundamental first. The reason it's the First Amendment is kind of like foundational. So you ain't changing the foundation of this country and the way it's been interpreted because you got lots of people stacked up on both sides. It's like, let's you know, have a conversation about gun control and see what happens in terms of emotion. <laughs> this is an emotional issue. Um, so again, it's a really insightful question because I think in the past, this has shown that now times have changed. I gave you examples of the influence of media, unprecedented. Technology, unprecedented. So we have a lot of things going on that were very different than when the founding fathers' incredible intentionality of writing that for good, um, we're going to probably see. And uh, and if we don't have to, by the way, we don't have to get there necessarily by changing that, I would tell you. Embedded in your document, what I think is the one where I would be concerned about if I were in those, or if I, is where we, where the government and where the Air Force have a lot of latitude is in ability to get into your social media. Now, I'm going to give you a factoid. When I retired in 2014, I was the number one social media per personnel, if you will, had the greatest social media presence in the United States. Um, you would think that for a moment back then, I, was, I would celebrate that. Now I'm not on social media um, for a couple of different reasons. But my point is, I was reading in your guide, and where the law, what happens is when we sign up, whether we realize it or not, we're inviting a lot. You know, you've got security clearances and other things, but I would encourage you. You and everybody you lead and are around go back because they make it implicit in there. And I think it's good. That creates a mechanism to be able to now get inside your world and there they can it itself can affect what you're participating in. More importantly, what you're saying. There are real teeth already in what happens and what you do. A simple like now on Facebook could end a career. I'm telling you, I read that thing and I'm again, I'm no expert, but I know a few things. I've been around the block a couple of times. And out of that whole guide would stood out. So we'll get there we'll, because that's just a bigger thing to undertake. But there are not so subtle ways that we can enforce participation or involvement or vocalization of what we're supporting. And as long as we're wearing this, and they don't have as many teeth when you get out, but when you're wearing this uniform, I'm telling you, um, I would think that wings and others, some other guidance to come will probably be around judicious use of social media and helping people understand the consequences of even an inadvertent like, because they use an example of someone liking some post that something probably resonated from a photo. They probably didn't do the homework to understand what the group represented. And I think they got like an article 15. I mean, it was, it was like real punishment. So if anything for that, so hopefully thank you for asking that question. There are ways to get there. And I think, We'll see some refinement of this, but I wanted to use this opportunity to go out of everything I read in your whole guide this morning. I began to reread that whole thing. That was the one that really struck me that um, I would hate to see a promising career 
disrupted because we live in such a social media centric culture and we become desensitized and then you add your uniform to it. And now the fact that we have this thing called the UCMJ, because they talked about, well, how can Congress can do this and other things? They don't have the UCMJ. <laughs> and for leaders, that doesn't have to be a bad weapon. That's actually a framework that distinguishes us from everybody else. We go, I volunteer to wear this and abide by that. So you got the big constitution and then you have the UCMJ. And so you know how you're gonna answer that question in the long run? Watch how we affect what we do via the UCMJ and how we represent ourselves both tangibly and socially. And I predict that area is a minefield. It was already a minefield. I think there's, it's gonna be huge. We need to make our people, again, this is coming from the guy who's a social, you know, social media crazy person. And I like it because there's ways to reach. It can be for good. I'm just telling you, it better be a touch. That might be a takeaway for the wing to think about. It's how do we really think through how we help people understand what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. Yeah, one of the things that I didn't think was fully fleshed out, and we haven't done this um, uh, as, as Department of Defense to teach us about social media. You know, we, we certainly know. Uh, so here's Light War, Peter Singer's book, this weaponization of social media. Now, this probably I know, that's perfect. I mean, that's this, so seamless. Yes, it's oh, perfect. You're a genius. So, um, this talks more about the pull factors of our enemies or extremist groups and how they use the beautiful thing of the internet and social media to pull you away. When you get pushed, yep. somebody else could potentially pull you into their sphere because all of a sudden now I have value. Um, exactly. I connect with the right people, but we haven't taught ourselves very good social media. We, we've all just been thrust into this. Some of us as Gen Xers, we molded into it. Boomers are starting to figure this out, right? Um, there's some great people out there that, that use it for such amazing things. And, and, and I love using it. Uh, but I tell you, as a leader, I, I, you got to be careful. And even when you are, you got to at least understand that these things could take a life of their own. You, you can be so prescriptive in how you're going to design it perfectly. And you, you put a hashtag and all of a sudden those letters mean something else. And now they think you're affiliated with this group because you used a hashtag, but you didn't think meant that. And, and, and so there's landmines everywhere. You can't see them. Do you remember after January 6th, did you see what they did? So we had the photographs, right? Yep. But what did they go? What was the first thing they mined? Once they started getting leads on folks, they were going to their social media. And then if they got like a web, you may not even be direct, but if you're second quarter, what I'm just saying is, to your point, we can't be careful. We should use it for good. But if in doubt, I would say I would hit the button these days. In the old days, I realized that it wasn't intentionally being reckless. <laughs> I thought I was doing good by doing a lot of things around leadership and positivity and all that. But in my glee sometimes to like and for, um, I don't know that today, I uh, I know today I would Yeah. Well, I think there's real danger. You brought it up, you, you like something. Um, or you forward an article that has one headline, but you didn't read the article. <laughs> yep. and, and I'm sure no one's done that in here. Has but. anybody ever done that? Nobody's done that. <laughs> right. right. So, um, yeah, and, and there are some people like, did you really read the headline? Did you really read what this doctor said about this? Or, you know, maybe it was about or that he happens to be a neo Nazi. Did you read his bio? <laughs> yeah. um, and I think we're so quick to share life, thumbs up, thumbs down, you know, we become Romans, right? You know, so everything is this, and uh, we're not taking the time anymore to fully understand context, to ask the questions. E even when you're dealing with social media, you can still ask the questions. And to me, that is about diving into something a little bit more, understanding who put this up and who is this group. So to me, the question asking is actually asking Google, who is this group? You know, I'll just yes. make up a name. The, the Pullman group, I, I don't know, you know, who is the Pullman group and what do they do? Read their website, read what they're all about. Exactly. You know, they put it out there. And even the extremist organizations, they clearly say, a lot of them, we're a neo-Nazi group. I mean, they're actually not very bashful about it. Nope, you're right. Um, but somehow they hook, they hook good people in. Well, and we are, um, we don't realize it, but we're being wired. So I'm gonna just give you another quick private study. I hope that it helps. Another study just came out about the effect on cognition of the World Wide Web. Now it's been around now, right? And one of the things that's come out um, 
we've known about children per se, but really we're realizing it's affects all of us. Is we live, we know we live in a hyper vigilant society. I mean, I admit to you, I my wife reminds me, others remind me. I mean, I have my phone. I mean, I I've trained myself that I have to check it periodically, all, all that. But what's happened is we've rewired ourselves without even knowing it. That our cognition patterns now do a couple of things. They make us hyper vigilant. We're aware. being aware of when things are dinging and clicking, and we got that's like a Pavlonian response to probably get involved and respond to that. Um, but the bigger one is our incredibly fractured attention spans and our propensity to multitask. Now, some may be better than others. I'm just telling you, this, uh, science just literally just came out. And what that means is in our automated response to any of those things, like cognitively I'm wired to like, oh, yep, this is something else I need to forward and I need to click it. We are wiring out some of the safety mechanisms by virtue of how we're rewiring ourselves in a very wired way. He'll talk about some of those things in one regard, but this is the neuroscience part, of it. The, so the cognitive, the, but from a cognition standpoint, we don't realize it. now decades of internet access. And now you add, what are we on year 15 of the advent of the smartphone that put the power of the internet in our pockets 24 7, 365 is now accelerating. So just us as human beings and the beautiful ability to have this incredible thing called the brain and create neuroplasticity and neural pathways. Oh, we're doing it. <laughs> but we're not aware of some of it. So when I read that study, I was like, oh my gosh, not, it's getting easier and easier. I'll just use this to set a claim on yourself by actually using a, because my brain is wired to respond. And, uh, and it's affecting all parts, of it, right? I go back to what I talked about, Putnam's bolding alone work, work that talked about bonding and binding social capital. But this is why people now, you know, innovative places are great and phone baskets, and things like that. We have to trade or tell ourselves, put it away, do these. We're having to go back to what was a normal pattern was connection and the phone and other devices were secondary. Do you notice how we've, and it's just the way it works. It's, it's the price of progress. Yeah. And we, so why I can't overstate the intentionality as people, as leaders, especially in areas where it's going to involve a clicking, a forwarding. There definitely is an emerging market spaces that people can go that is just really messed up. And and I think you're right. I've seen more and more businesses. You almost like check your weapon at the door. It's something yeah. that, and it is a weapon. That is the ultimate weapon. <laughs> he's, yeah, I don't he's just told you right there. He's yeah. the ultimate weapon. It is so much more damage for the smartphone and the public. Because where he picks up is push factors are the things discrimination, perceived injustice, all those things that push us away that makes us feel marginalized. So extremism happens in the space of marginalization or disconnection. I no longer feel I belong. I can connect. Then he picks up with, now you're in the pull factors because there's a lot of forces pulling for us. So whether they're marketing forces for our dollar or whether they're radical forces, ISIS's social media strategy, right? Their number one strategy was social media strategy. Absolutely genius. I mean, it's ISIS, so I'm not talking. But what they did, and I think that's a lot of what he talks about, is it was incredible because they knew exactly how to find people who were pushed to the edge and bring them right in. Unbelievable. But it showed the power of these forces. And again, we're not here to, just, I, I don't want to bash the media. I, I'm a consumer of it. Um, I kind of expand my spectrum of it as mm -hmm. I take it in. You know, I don't set on any one thing anymore, whether it be print media or audio or podcast, whatever. You certainly, I think these days, if you want to consume in a fair way, you really have to diversify what you're taking. Absolutely right. And, and kind of question. Absolutely right. Um, it can still be good. Yeah, absolutely. But as absolutely. long as we're not feeding, remember we started this part of the conversation around our confirmatory bias. So our comfortable thing to do is find things that are reinforced in the narrative in my head or the history in my, in my, in my background. The courageous thing to do, the right thing to do is to constantly now introduce things that don't, that I may be uncomfortable. I might want to read things in it. So it's exactly what you say. But all those things, we do that work. I think I go back to intentionality. Keep a broad spectrum of what you're doing. Asking questions, if you don't do anything else, that's why I like question asking. By inviting other things, you're going to learn things. Mm -hmm. You don't have to read anything. You just ask somebody else's opinion, ask their perspective and do this. And it's the fundamental. I mean, I would tell you, one of the things we talked about is we're coming out of COVID, so let's rate it back. So yes, we're talking about extremism, but we've had all our own experience with isolation. I mean, we're all so hungry for getting back to what we think. We talked, we talked, talked about that this morning. Good. Yeah. We're hungry for it, right? And so we have unparalleled opportunities 
because people now are really hungry for those things. So to come back to create this sense of, um, of and that, that's where I think there can be, in all things, there can be a blessing in what we've just experienced with COVID because the conditions are right for like what you guys are doing today. I loved you did on a Wednesday. You know, Friday you get off half a day, we kind of go through that and that's all right. The nice thing is this is middle of the week. So it's like, wow, this is feeling really, like really bonus. And then more importantly, you get connects Thursday and Friday. You can reinforce these conversations informally at the, I don't know if we have, hopefully we have coffee pots or water coolers, or wherever people connect in, in, in squadrons and things like that today. Um, and that's all we got to do. I mean, that's, and so be look, looking for those kind of spaces. And I think you all did a really good uh, time. I think the Wednesday was a genius pick because you're going to get a lot of return on investment. But this reinforces, and like probably you were talking about, we've never had a time that I can remember where there's been so much innate demand. Again, I'm in the hospitality business, amongst other things. We have some restaurants, which has some, by the way, COVID. It made us innovate, and that's a different conversation for a different day. But what I see now is the minute we started lifting these restrictions, it was like a flood of humanity. If any of you have been trying to go out to eat on Thursday or Friday or Saturday night, go to Drake's or something, right? Uh, yeah, you've got to get, go there an hour ahead, get your name on the list. And then because, but that's a reflection of our craving for getting into a space, a different experience. But it's also, we just like to hear the murmur and see the other humans. <laughs> Not that you don't like the people you've been trapped with in your house, condo, wherever for the last year. But that's why I think it's beautiful. We have a unique opportunity. Yeah. And we're seeing that in our own business. And it's really cool because uh, uh, I think there's going to be some really interesting things that could come out of here structurally that will change society for good if we, if we, can, if we can make it work. Chief, you had, had shown a picture at the end of the slide when you talking about the challenge of the times, these things that we're talking about today, the environment that we're just living in. We have an unprecedented level of stress that's, you know, that is horrific right now in the United States. Yep, it is, absolutely. And so what is a young SEO or to do today to navigate this, to navigate the local agents. You know, they're not as equipped as someone who studies this at a PhD level, right? You know, we're, we're not equipped at that stage. What, what kind of advice would you say to, to give them to lead in this environment? So I think that's a great question. And so the beautiful thing about being able to study, which we're all lifelong learners, or have I've taken mine to the extreme, and then we get to be practitioners. So it's if you only exist over here and you're learning, then that's not even half the equation. If you're just a practitioner and you're not learning, so it's when these two worlds converge. So here's what I've learned in bringing together both a lot of time in high-end academia, but also a lot of time as a practitioner. I've led organizations every single level, um, some successfully, some not as successfully, also the best I would like. And I go back to, I told you a little while ago that I would try to leave you with something that you could think about. And by the way, this five things come are grounded in the field of neuroleadership, social cognition. Oh, and by the way, they're into all the things that actually force that influence people going to be extremists. So it actually, I think, ties all these things quite nicely. And uh, so there's a framework. And what we know, and some of you may already be familiar with this work, um, that we as human beings, we know that we feel first and think second. Um, and though that's why the world of emotional intelligence was such a big deal years ago, because it was kind of like the advent and validation of the software skills. And we call it emotional intelligence. But what that means is because we are wired and we actually experience up through the back and the base of our back, right? So this feeling first is there has to be a level of intentionality that you learn or you do something about. Otherwise, if you react straight from emotion, I think we've all kind of been like perhaps you feel something and then you say something about two seconds later, you're like, oh, that's perfect. And so that's where emotional, but in refining that, what we've learned is beyond the fact that so we're wired to kind of react to something. And that reaction from feeling first manifests, and this happens at a one one hundredth of a millisecond. We don't know. It. Every one of us, no matter your race, background, culture, age, are constantly interpreting the social cues in our environment. Uh, and in our actions with other people. And we're making a, a momentary second by second decision. Am I leaning in or am I pushing back? Am I leaning in? Is this a threat to me? And that means I'm hoping. it's our fundamental fight or flight response. And what neuroscientists have found is that in managing that to leaning in, 
in forging connection and having a positive experience, there's five things that every single person in this room and on this planet is constantly seeking to make this little decision that you would never be able to imagine because it's happening so fast. The first one is status. How we are always measuring our sense of relevant importance to the other. We, and that's because we live and we just are naturally wired to know that we are. Uh, it doesn't mean we have to be top dog, top rank. It just means to know that I have value. And that makes sense, right? So status, we're always assessing. That's why I think about extremism. When people lose a, 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 the sense that they have value to a society or to a people group, boop, there goes a push factor, right? I'm just push someone now away. They're now moving into threat mode when people engage. The second is certainty. Our brains are pattern recognition machines. We get up in the morning, our feet hit the ground. And if you're like me, you want to hit that coffee pop button and hear the beautiful goodness dripping in about a minute. And to me, there's a certainty that that's going to happen. It's a simplistic example, but we want certainty. This is why change efforts are so hard. You know, when they wrote uh, move my, you know, about the whole move my cheese, when we talk about punting and moving people's cheese, it's an example of disrupting certainty. And that's why people make a fortune as consultants and teaching people how to go through change is I'm really just giving you some artful ways to manage certain. But our brains right away are looking for what I know. Hmm, sounds like inflammatory bias adds to it. So uh, we want to know for certain. And so what that means is because we want to have a sense of the next one, that we can have some sense in this certainty. We want to have an idea that I can understand where the world's going. I can see how I might influence that. And think how hard that is today at the rate of change and all the things that we read about. So, uh, and I'll give you examples of how we can do all these in a second. So certainty is another thing. We're and when something doesn't line up to what our brain is saying, wait a second, it's always been like this. Why today is it like that? Ding, 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 cognitive dissonance, brain turbulence is what I call it. And so now we're off balance. We're moved to a more of a fear or reactionary state and I'm moving away. The next one is autonomy. By the way, for younger generation, the number one. Autonomy is this, the perceived sense I can have some kind of exert control over my environment. This is such a big deal. When we, how do we feel when we're out of control, when we don't feel a sense of control? I'm not talking control over people in the masses. I'm talking about the daily choices of our lives. Start taking control away from it. And that, so what happens then is when that sense of loss of control and the way that occurs to people, even these marginalization is, they can't see a way out. They can't see a different way. And so they don't feel that their voice has a matters. They don't feel that they can actually do anything. Now you go to relatedness, right? We are born to belong. We are wired to connect. And so what happens is COVID. Okay, I, I, I mean, we can pick a lot of them. I told you about bonding and binding social capital. I told you about the effect of COVID. These are things that make it harder to relate because we feel when we belong, and that's why we are so blessed, what the Air Force does so well, and I've not been able to find as well since then, as, as, as intense, is we feel we belong to something that is so much bigger than us and is so special, and we're, at, we're entrusted to carry it on, and we wake up with just the pride, and this is why for the rest of our lives, if we're normal, we will always say, I'm a veteran. That's why they do that. And so relatedness is so, so what happens when someone feels they don't long belong to a people group anymore? They've been alienated. Okay, so now you understand how they start to be pushed back out there. But we as human beings, when I don't feel that relation, I'm not pushing back. And the last one is fairness. The top reason we find people going to extremism, they lose a sense that they can be dealt with in a way that is equitable, equitable doesn't matter everything. Equitable doesn't mean it's equal. It just means that I have to feel or believe that I'm going to have a chance to be able to shape circumstances differently or at least be heard. So what you hear in this status, certainty, autonomy related in this fairness, our brains are constantly, whether we know it or not, making measurements about how effective. And I would tell you that's the definition of leadership. I started by telling a little while ago that Google did this study like, ah, we don't need leaders, we just need smart people. Well, they found out they were wrong. And when I talked about psychological safety, they realized, no, what you really need is you need people. We call them leaders who are aware 
And they actually, there's a very famous picture you can Google about the board. So when they were unpacking the outcome of this two-year study to their team, they talked about all the factors for innovation and all that. But right smack over here on the right side of the board, they said, and we found a formula why we need leaders. And they actually wrote status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, and fairness from neuroscience, the SCARF model it's called. And they realized when those conditions are present, people will lean in, they'll feel part of something, they'll do their best work, they'll take risks, they'll do everything the United States Air Force asks people to do every single day. And here's the beautiful thing. Don't need a PhD to do it. Don't have to be a commander or, or a, command, uh, you know, a command chief to do it. It's literally one conversation at a time. It's I go back to intentionality. And how, you know how we do these things? It's simply about, this is why we say about how we're intentional about the language. How we're intentional about engaging with feedback. That's intentionally, that's positive. You can give critical. You need, you need to be able to give direct feedback. All these things about how intentional, how do we invite people different than us to a conversation? Staff sergeants in Afghanistan in a war zone doing a seven billion dollar project that we was supposed to supposedly accomplish, but it kept on going. And there's and you have your own examples. So tangibly, I say, man, let's not reinvent the wheel. I you know looked at what happened with it. And those people got pushed there, not overnight, but at the end of the day, they made an individual decision. And that decision, I believe, was reinforced by years of not feeling a sense of status or value in their society, that they could have any control around their circumstances, that they no longer could make sense of what the world might look like and have a sense of certainty. They could not feel connected to another group of people anymore. And that's why we always have this lone, you know, this kind of lone wolf syndrome or those kind of things. Well, again, they got there because this system. And what I always wonder is whether it's a parent because it starts there, a teammate, classmate, a friend, I mean, there's a whole bunch of people that can intervene in this process. And that, I think, is a solution for the really after this conversation. Is like, will there always be some folks who are going to operate on the fringe and want to do bad things? Sure. Unfortunately, we see it with shooters and other things. What we should celebrate is that is a very tiny micro fraction of the population. And I think what we can do as leaders is if we can be more intentional about saying, well, I can learn something from science. If I do those things, good enough for Google and Everybody and and, it, and all they did is really emerge a view inside our heads and our hearts and makes us respond. I'm like, that's how. We're gonna do it. And we'll never know. You know why? Because that person's no longer pushed to the edge. Somehow they reoriented back to the middle. And in they're doing that, we don't know what kind of issues we probably again we'll never get the credit. And that's not our credit. But we would have done your part. That's how we end in John Michelle's view is we use a little science a heck of a lot of intentional leadership and a commitment to serve other people and just uh, um, right where they're at. And, and I know that's where we connect. These are the things that oh, we're both passionate about. Yeah. And I think that's why you're here going like, it's Wednesday. I can be bold. I can do a lot of things. And you're still going to get some of that day back. But I'm hopeful by leaving you with this five. And if you want what I'll do. So there's a whole bunch of stuff out there about it, but I'm going to send a chart. Because each of these have behaviors you could do. I taught this class for years. Um, SF here in the Air Force and a bunch of things. I will send the briefing and everything that I did, uh, that I've put together on this about like, how do I achieve status? How do we achieve certainty with my people? I will send it to your wing man and he can do whatever he wants. And I hope that that's a resource that's available to you so you can add some context. Do you have any questions for and that's okay. We'll keep going. We got about four or five more hours. At least. <laughs> All right, I want to say this because you you say this phrase in a, a lot. Uh, Katara, who, who we'll talk to tonight, she said this phrase a lot. Uh, our command chief for AMC, Chief Kruselneck, he says this all the time and then usually screams after he says, lead with love. And I can hear him saying, woohoo! You know, like yep. that, that's, that's him in a nutshell. There's a lot of leaders saying this now. It, it, you were writing about this years ago. I mean, you're still talking about it. That, to me, was a very uh, a big cornerstone to you. Uh, it used to be quirky to say, right? It, it was. It doesn't seem so quirky anymore. Now, I would tell you, so I just did a program. There's a big consulting firm out. Uh, you may know Barry Paybeller. Huge fan of this company. They make, like, what I consider non-sexy things like corrugated boxes, 
all the things that make big things happen was it's hard about the story it's be so, um is Bob Chapman, who was the CEO of the owner's private company, his dad died unexpectedly. And Bob inherited this company, it was an $18 million company in the rent. Today, that company is $3.2 billion. And it's been doing 18% a year return. Now that matters because business performance matters. But the more important thing is Bob had an epiphany. And he realized he was in church. And he looked at this and goes, why can't we be like this more important? Here we're talking about all the good things in the youth condition, passion and empathy and authenticity and all those, right? And so he, years ago, put his whole company on, on a trajectory to make that a priority. They've been so successful, they now have a whole leadership institute to teach us a global league. So not long ago, I did a talk about this, and, they, and it was um, about leading in a post-COVID, right? How do we lead effectively? And my premise is, the roles and power structures have changed. People's perception of power have changed. And what they respond to, and COVID's accelerated, is we yearn for authenticity, connection with our leaders. We yearn, and part of this is generation. Uh, you're not going to tell a kid that had a, you know, started with an iPad when he was six months old long enough to basically flop it into his computer, and then be given a smartphone and have limited uh, ability to exercise choice in voice. And all of a sudden tell me you come into an organization and you're not going to get those things. So my point is we want leaders now that are going to engage us and connect with us and all of us. doesn't mean that we have to still do hard things, we have to make decisions, but it's the advent of the soft skill revolution is finally here. <laughs> I've been, it's just a natural affinity for us to have like my parents to watch and things I'm involved in and things I've read. I was writing about this back in the early, you know, like, 80s, my whole dissertation around love and leadership. Um, and it had a bit of a faith orientation, so it didn't, you know, that was okay in that. You look at my license plate, I'm actually, right, for, I am an imperfect practitioner of it, but I remind myself that the soft skill leader time is now. The COVID world has created a yearning for connection. We have changes in generation, we have a lot of reasons that we be afraid of reasons to suffer. And when we think about love, it's really simple. Does the other person, space, does the other person believe that I am, that I have their interests in mind? That's it. When a leader, when you, when someone convinces you that they, you, they have your best interest, that's what the whole goal of negotiation is. Certainly, as I figured out after 28 years, <laughs> even that in her view i mean but it's a constant trying to find to communicate to the other thing oh and by the way that whole scarf thing i just told you you can see how these all meet. i am terribly excited because i think the age of loving leadership people are going to embrace it more and more or be willing to use it and again it's not so much the language you use it's the actions we make and i think it's here so i'm quite excited there's a article I found just a couple nights ago uh, uh, from government. Greatest of their greatest of these is love. But what caught my attention was the quote as the article starts. It's only three, three pages long. Uh, Most people need love and acceptance a lot more than they need advice. And, Beautiful. And, and here's a leader who has worked on his alternative leadership style for a while. And and here's what he says some things to that have helped him in his authentic journey here is understand and demonstrate vulnerability listen actively and empathetically lead with questions become more coach like uh it's not rocket science it, it's actually out there more out in our face than we realize um we get trapped yeah we get trapped sometimes i think in the in the headlines that the country's going to pot. Oh well, the sky is falling. I, I've never been a sky is falling person. No, you yeah. haven't. Just why well, I love you. It's not. Yeah, <laughs> um, I know when the sky is falling, and there's been some bad days, but the uh, I've I've had to desensitize. We've, media, smartphones, everything has magnified everything so much that I I, I think we need to have that conversation. Don't get over amplified. 
the world around us. Find spaces we can go to. Maybe our kids and wheezy. Let's keep it. Yeah. Scott first asked me to do this today. Bottom line is this thing. All things. Our role, as you're describing, is develop eyes to see, maybe what others can, ears to hear, maybe what others won't, and then a, a heart to receive, because that's really what we call learning. And when that cycle kicks off, that's what we talk about. Right? Yeah, that's authenticity, that's vulnerability. And that, in the age of the power over leader, a couple industries can get over it. That age is formed. I would tell you, whole generations of young people. And now we have a remote society that you don't have to. That's a different conversation for a different day. Leading in a remote world is a very different, interesting proposition. How you do that effectively. And I tell you what, world-class listening is the key. Because you don't have the social cues anymore behind a screen as much as you learn. So there's lots of other things to talk about for a different day, but you're exactly right. More and more people are writing like People are building $3 billion companies around it, and now they're teaching other companies like America. So I'm quite uh, enthused that, yes, it was, that was a not a good day for America and democracy on the 6th of January. It was a clarion call, however, that, yeah, we need to do better. We need to be more intentional. And I applaud the Air Force for giving us the time to have a conversation. Yeah, I can probably guarantee there's not a lot of companies that have this conversation. Um, we're talking about diversity and inclusion, and that's a different thing. But even that in isolation, again, other things, is only going to be minimally impactful. The reality is I think we we are at a time of unprecedented progress. I can measure it. We won't in terms of how many pe you know, people of color, women, our representation and leadership roles and everything is changing for the better. We still have some bad things that happen, but you hit it. That's not the sensation. I'm not impressed with Asher completely. I just want people to know that they have an agenda. And so it relies on us. Because the world is still good. There are still amazing opportunities that people want to be led and inspired. And again, I've got to do a lot of things, but one of the things we have to think we're not going to get to. At the end of the day, even trying to replicate it is not a business owner in the peace we This is the greatest. That's why it's a joy to be invited to spend. It's no organization can represent it fully or can, can replicate it. It's going to start to bring it in. And when we train them at boot camp or in training, we reinforce it. We have a long history of being willing to raise our hand and go die for something. Like that. I'm pretty sure there's not people die at Walmart. Um, and, and they don't need to. But I, the one thing that I so appreciate more than that, and sometimes you got to get to the other side, right? I think we've all probably been um, I appreciate it when I was in, loved every second of it. Um, the group of people we're with today are the ones that are going to continue to make something. That's why I'm committed in my own little anyway. I want more business owners that are veterans because they get to now set the conditions and set the so that people that work for them can know what it's like to feel. There you go, brother. All right. Do we have anything up there? No pressure. Anything online, we're good? Okay. Anything them in the room? All right. Yeah. Thank you for the time. I appreciate it as always. I'm Dude, I get to hang out with you. Time. I get to meet you all. Thanks for listening. Um, and then I hope I'll get to open with some of y'all somewhere. We're in the community. Uh, we're available, and I'm grateful for you. Thank you for what you continue to do to um, inspire and guide and invest in the people in your life. With that, thank you all. Run, go do good stuff. It's only like 220 something. Go do something fun.